Yeah, welcome to numerical methods for mathematical finance. So I like to discuss uh, computer arithmetic. So let's have a look how the computer represents and calculates with floating point numbers. So in this small session, yeah, when we have half an hour, I will first discuss how the computer represents these numbers and we will already see a few issues with this number. And then in the next session, we will discuss how he is performing calculations and we will dig a little bit deeper into these problems. And in the end, we also find a solution to sum up a large amount of numbers without errors. So the IEEE 754 standard represents a certain subset of the real numbers, yeah, the floating point numbers, and these floating point numbers are encoded by three integers, S, C, and E. Yeah, so we now know integers. The three integers have different ranges. The S will encode the sign. Yeah, so I need one bit plus or minus, then the C will encode the mantissa. So we will use P bits for that. And then there is an exponent, which is, which is encoding a little bit the scale. And I will use R bits for this. On this slide, you see that there is a little bit a strange interval here. So my exponent, my e, uh, comes from the interval e min minus one to e max plus one. Yeah. So you would maybe expect that the interval is from e min to e max. And that's also what I will use in the next definition. But there are two additional values at the end of the intervals, which I will use later. Yeah. So that's the reason why the expo why the e here has um, an interval that is e min minus one to e max plus one included. So if I use R bits for this exponent, it means that uh, e max minus e min plus the two additional values at the end plus one yeah, uh, is two to the power of um, R. So common situations is that the number of bits add up to 32, which is the float, or 64, which is the double. So one plus P plus R is 64 for the double. Yeah, the set of floating point numbers contains the so-called normalized floating point numbers. So this is this set. So given now some constants, yeah, so we have chosen how many bits we use for C. Yeah, so the P is given. And we also have chosen the interval which describes the exponent, then the normalized base two, you can generalize this base two floating point number is given by the X in R, which is minus one to the power of S. So encoding the sign. And then it's one plus C divided by two to the power of P multiplied with two to the power of E. Where C is now a constant, so it's an integer between zero included and two to the power of P not included. So you already see here from this definition that this guy is between one and two, one included, two not included. So if you like to represent the number two, the C jumps to zero and you just increment the E, yeah? then you have one times two. Huh? Okay, so I'm illustrating these numbers here below. So what's the smallest positive guy? The smallest positive guy would be C equal zero and E is equal to E min. So that's this guy here, two, to the power of e min is the smallest one. 
if c is equal to two and if I increase the e, yeah, actually I'm jumping to two to the power of e min plus one, two to the power of e min plus two. So I'm jumping and I'm always doubling the length of the interval. And in between the interval, the c is now creating an equipartitioning. So this guy here is, for example, z equals to one, two, three. Yeah? So what you have depicted here is p equals two. So two to the power of p is four. Yeah? So I have four numbers, zero, one, two, three. Yeah? And then it repeats. Of course, you have the same on the other side. Yeah? So this here is always encoded with the c. Yeah? One, two, three. And on the other side, the same if the sign is negative. This is the scale and encoded by the E and this is the C encoding then the equipartitioning of these intervals. And there is a funny thing. We have no way to represent zero. Yeah? So the thing is that this interval here is missing. So I have that zero is not in this set. Okay, before we fix this problem, before I fill, fill this gap, uh, let me discuss a little bit the properties of these uh, numbers. So I already mentioned that this part that contains the C is here between one and two, becomes performs the equi equipartitioning, and we have then E creating the scale, the smallest number, yeah, we also had this, this is two to the power of E min, yeah, the smallest positive one, the largest negative one is minus two to the power of E min. And we noted that this interval is not part of this set. A nice property of these numbers is, if you look at two, neighboring numbers that have the same sign, then the relative distance of these guys is approximately constant. So let's consider two numbers. So I consider here one plus C divided by two to the power of P multiplied with two to the power of E. And the next number is then increase C, yeah, C plus one. So the next number would be one plus C plus one divided by two to the power of P multiplied with two to the power of E. Well, if the C is already the um, last number, last possible number, that would be two to the power of P minus one. Then this here is exactly one. So one plus one is two, and you see that this is exactly increment the e. Yeah. So actually, this formula is also correct if c is already the last uh, uh, possible number, the two to the power of p minus minus one. So this is the representation of two numbers that are yeah just adjacent, so just two neighboring numbers. And if you now calculate the relative error of these two numbers, so you calculate say, for example, this guy minus this guy. The relative error means I calculate the difference and I divide by, you know, say, for example, x1. So if you divide by x1, you see that the two to the power of e yeah, factors out x2 minus x1. They both have this factor. It factors out and then it cancels. And what you are left with is the difference of these two guys here. So the one is canceling. So it's just one divided by two to the power of P divided by one plus C divided by two to the power of P. Yeah, and because this here is between one included, two not included, yeah, we know that this relative distance of these two numbers is now between one divided by two to the power of P plus one, 
additional division by two and one divided by two to the power of P. First one not included, second one included. So you see the relative diff distance is always smaller than one divided by two to the power of P. Uh, two, you know, yeah, one. So I have that this here is smaller than one divided by two to the power of P. This is an important result because it tells you that if you have some rounding error, the rounding error, if you have rounded to the nearest representative, the relative rounding error is always smaller than one divided by two to the power of P. Okay, so let's go back now and ask ourselves, how do we fill this gap here? So in addition to this set of the so-called normalized floating point numbers, there is a second set. And this second set is the set of the denormalized floating point numbers. And this set also contains x equals zero. So here is the description of this set. P and E min are given, yeah? We have fixed them in the very beginning. And the set of denormalized floating point numbers is now encoded with S and C. Uh, it is minus one to the power of S. So again, S is encoding the sign. Multiplied now with C divided by two to the power of P. Multiplied with two to the power of E min. So you see that this guy here is now between zero and one, one not included. So the last number that I can represent is two to the power of P minus one divided by two to the power of P. So the next number I would like to represent yeah, would be, be the one. Of course, everything multiplied with the two to the power of E min. So I represent the numbers that are here below the two, to the power of e min. The two to the power of e min was already in the other set. Yeah, with the sign and also above minus two to the power of e min. And in this interval, I now perform an equidistant partitioning. So that's the zero, one, two, three. There's a funny thing. You observe you have two different zeros, yeah? Minus zero, minus one, minus two, minus three. So there are two different zeros. There's a plus zero and a minus zero. And you can also check this in the, in, in the computer. And this is filling the gap. So you switch the part that was formerly here, one included, to two, yeah? and now you switch this part here to something that is between zero and one. So you drop this one plus. Yeah? So for these guys here, looking at the relative distance wouldn't make sense. Yeah? Um, because if you, if you calculate a relative error with these numbers, it could happen that you divide by zero. Yeah? So a relative distance doesn't make sense if you are close to zero or if you have small numbers. So in this case, we look at the absolute distance. And here we have that the absolute distance of two neighboring numbers is constant. Yeah? So for a very small number, we have an estimate for the ab absolute bounding error. So this representation, yeah, when is it activated? So it is activated if the computer sees that the E is equal to E min minus one. Yeah? So I mentioned that we have for the E, these special values, E is equal to E min minus one and E is equal to E max plus one. So the two values which we did not use in the definition of the normalized floating point numbers. And if the E, the integer becomes equal to E min minus one, he's switching the representation to that one. Yeah? So actually he's filling, filling the gap. So 
here are the numbers now all together. Yeah. So the normalized floating point numbers, they go to minus E min. Uh, sorry, they go to minus two to the power of E min on the left and on the right. And they have increasing scales here. In between, we have the equipartitioning, C equals zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, and so on. And also on the left. And the denormalized numbers now fill this gap here. So we have zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. And we have a nice discretization of our number axis. So in addition, the computer can take some special values. And these special values are now encoded if the E is equal to E max plus one. So if the E is equal to E max plus one, there is a third encoding in a certain sense, and we are encoding special values. There is the minus and the plus infinity. So the minus and the plus infinity are encoded by S equals one and C equals zero is the minus infinity and plus infinity is encoded with S equals zero, C equals zero, okay? And if C is not equal zero, that's just an error code. So something went wrong because for example, for the result square root of minus one, you need something that indicates you, okay, something is wrong. And he will indicate this with the so-called uh, not a number, so this guy is some kind of error code. So this value, these special value are activated if the computer sees that the integer E is E max plus one. So with the infinity, there is a funny thing and this thing will become important if we discuss uh, the integer arithmetic if we calculate with these integers. So actually minus infinity and plus infinity, they can be seen as just numbers. Well, if you have C equals zero and E equal E max plus one, then if you now look at our normalized floating point numbers, so our formula, so C equals zero means that this part here is not there, yeah? So it's just minus one or plus one times two to the power of E max plus one. So these guys are just the next number on our discretization line. Yeah? So you see that the infinity, minus infinity and plus infinity would correspond to the normalized floating point numbers minus two to the power of E max plus one for the minus infinity plus two to the power of E max plus one for the plus infinity. So they these guys sit here as if they were numbers and this will be important yeah, if we look at arithmetic operations to understand that they can be interpreted as numbers. So in summary, we have now our representation of the floating point numbers. So the three integers S, C, and E encode our set. So there is the normalized floating point numbers sine times one plus C divided by two to the power of P, the mantissa multiplied with the exponent if E is between E min and E max, or we switch to the denormalized floating point numbers multiplied with two to the power of E min, if E is equal E min minus one, or we have these special 
values plus or minus infinity, yeah, always here with the with the sign encoded by the S. And of course, there is our error code. Yeah, so as, as a summary for this, uh, for the for the bits, we have one bit for the sign, P bits for the mantissa, R bits for the exponent. And then it depends a little bit how you choose this. The standard has um, a choice. So for a floating point number that uses 32 bit, he uses eight bits for the exponent and 23 bits for the mantissa. Yeah, that gives you exponents that are between minus 127 and plus 128, uh, both not included. And um, for 64 bit, yeah, you have 11 bits for the exponent, 52 bit for the um, mantissa. Yeah? So maybe you, you recall th that guy here, okay? This here is maybe important for our floating point double. The P is equal to 52. Yeah, so recall this is the guy yeah, that we had C divided by two to the power of P. Yeah, This is the guy that we had there. And we had that the distance, the relative error is smaller than one divided by two to the power of P. Maybe we have to uh, recall that if we work with the, with the floating point double. So to conclude, let's play a little bit with this. Uh, I have a small exercise here. So what is the smallest positive non-zero floating point number, double min value for a double? So actually you could um, just check this now. So let's create um, a class. So let's call it floating point arithmetic experiment. So you could just um, ask the double class for this constant. Yeah, there is here the max value and it's given here. Uh, and there's also the min value here. Okay, 4.9, 10 to the minus 300. But I would like to calculate this guy um, a little bit differently. So I would like to find the smallest positive number that is distinguishable from zero. So let me try the following. I divide this number by two and I check if this is larger than zero. Okay, there could be another case happening. Yeah, um, they, I could round the number to itself. So I also check if I divide this number of two, did it make any effect? Yeah. So I make the number smaller and smaller by dividing by two and I check, am I different from zero? And has the operation any effect? As long as this is the case, I'm performing the operation. So my tiny is equal to tiny divided by, divided by two. Yeah, what's that number? Let's print it. Okay, so that's a small number, 4.9 times 10 to the minus 324. That's a small number. Okay, so now let's play a little bit with, a little bit with this number. What actually happens if you divide this number by two? So I divide this number by two. Okay, so I get zero. So if you get zero, then we have the following effect. If you divide by two and you multiply by two, divide by two and you multiply by two, you get zero. However, if you do the opposite, if you multiply with two and you divide by two, you get again the number. Okay, that's clear, yeah. Uh, but you see that fundamental mathematical laws are violated here. Uh, what is this number? Okay, let's print what we 
guess what this number is. This number is the smallest denormalized number. So it's one divided by two to the power of P. So C equals one yeah, times two to the power of E min. Yeah? So this should be two to the power of, so we have a minus P yeah, because we have the one divided by two to the power of P and we have the E min. Okay, let's check if this is true. So maybe I just calculate two to the power of the P for a floating point double was 52. I have 52 bits yeah, and the E min was a minus 122. Yeah? So that was on this table on my, on my slide. Let's print that number and to see, okay, this is exactly this number. So what you have found is this guy, okay? So this guy here is two to the power of E min minus P, the smallest possible number that we can represent here. There, the smallest non-zero positive number. Well, this guy is very, very small and it appears as if this is not an issue, yeah? I mean, why should such a small number be important for our application? And well, as um, a motivation for our next session, I would like to make a similar experiment. Um, so let me just draw a small horizontal line here in my output. Okay, so I like to make now um, an experiment that illustrates maybe that we get problems much earlier. So I would like to find the smallest positive number x is two to the power of minus k such that one plus two x is larger than one but one plus X yeah, is violating this. So let's start maybe with some number. So epsilon is, now well, let's call it eps, is 1.0. And now I do the following check. So again, I divide the epsilon by two. So as long as one plus epsilon is larger than one. Well, actually to be precise, you also have to check that one plus two epsilon is larger than one plus epsilon. Okay, as long as this is the case, I make epsilon smaller and smaller. So let's print this number epsilon. So this guy will have a name, it's the machine precision. And this guy is one point something times 10 to the minus 16. So 16 digits yeah, we have. And this guy has now the property that one plus epsilon is one. So one plus epsilon is one, but epsilon is not zero. Fundamental things in mathematics are violated. But if you take one plus two epsilon, it is a number, okay? And maybe next time we should look at how these numbers now change, yeah? You see, some guys are the same, yeah? Some guys are different. So what is this number epsilon? So this number epsilon, if for example, this here is equal to one, then my one plus epsilon is this guy. Uh, and it is rounded back to one. Uh, so it is in between, it's actually one divided by well, if this here is one divided by two P, 
then the epsilon should be one divided by two P plus one. So let's print that and then we are done. So two to the power of minus P minus one, so minus P plus one, two to the power of minus 52 minus one, that's our epsilon, yeah? So it's related to this relative distance we have calculated. It's half the relative distance of this, these two floating point numbers, adjacent floating point numbers. So that was it for today, yeah, with the floating point numbers. And we will continue here, and I will have some, yeah, quite surprising examples why this is actually the root of all evil in numerical calculations in the computer. Thanks.